All righty, good morning, everybody. Nice to see you this morning. Nice to hear people having a chat with each other. Welcome to our uh, joint service this morning at the culmination of our family festival. I feel like I've spent the weekend eating food that hasn't been good for me, but I have enjoyed it. So thank you to all those who've prepared that food and who've made everything happen. We've appreciated it. We had a barbecue yesterday and a wee bit of a walk in the rain, uh, but it was good to be together. And today a bit of a breakfast and now we have worship together, which is just lovely. So really nice to see you here and you as part of what's going on. So let's just be still for a wee second. Lord, thank you that you're here with us. We thank you always. We don't take it for granted. We thank you that your spirit is here, that the living God is among us, Lord, that we are united because of our bonds in Christ. Thank you for these things. And Lord, would you help us and breathe life into our worship today? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All the words, as always, are up on the screen, so let's stand together. You can speak out the words in yellow. And let's do that from the start with a wee bit of gusto, okay? The Lord be with you. We're going to use our familiar uh, family festival call to worship. We are many God's great diversity. Different faces, different races. Butchers, bakers, website makers. Bankers, tailors, teachers, sailors. Fathers, mothers, sisters, brothers, single, married, broken, carried. The happy, the clappy, the barely out of nappies, the ancient, the modern, the famous, the forgotten. Some hopeful, some hopeless. Some cope well, some cope less. Some sure and some doubt. Some whisper, some shout. Those with abundance and those with need. Those who are generous or wrestle with greed. Elbows, tummies, knees and noses. Kidneys, femurs, teeth and toeses. Some unmentionable, some protected. Some accepted, some rejected. A broken body torn apart mars God's image and breaks God's heart. And yet our Father knows how the end will be when all his kids will sing in harmony, the bride will dazzle, her branches bloom. So add your voice to him the tune that we are one in Christ. So if you're able, let's stand and we'll sing together what our unity is formed in. It's formed in Christ. So we're going to sing Yet Not I together as we begin. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to Him. Play. 
to this I hope my shepherd will defend me through the deepest valleys he will lead all oh, the night has been won and I shall overcome yet not I but through Christ in me no fate I dread I know My sin has been defeated. Jesus now and never is my plea. Oh, the chains are released. I can sing, I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. to follow Jesus for he has said that he will bring me home and day by day I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne to this I hope my hope is only Jesus of all the glory Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Thy hope, my hope is only Jesus. For all the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. My lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Amen. Let's remain standing. And uh, just at the beginning of our, our service together, why don't you uh, have a wee shift from your chair and find someone you haven't said hello to for a wee while and just shake their hand and say good morning and how the summer's been, so stuff like that. So have a wee move around, find somebody you haven't spoken to for a wee while and just say hello to them, see how they're doing. We're going to take some time to say sorry to God. We're part of this family of God. We, we, we try to follow Christ in day to day, but we all know that we mess up. And so it's good to take time just to say sorry and also to receive God's forgiveness. It's a healing thing to do. So we do that and we do it from the heart. Let's not just rattle these words off. Let's really say sorry to God and receive his forgiveness. We'll use the words on the screen. God, our Father, we come to you in sorrow for our sins, for turning away from you and ignoring your will for our lives. Father, forgive us. For behaving just as we wish without thinking of you. Father, forgive us. By failing you by what we do, by what we think, and by what we say. Father, forgive us. for letting ourselves be drawn away from you by temptations in the world about us. Father, forgive us. For living as if we were ashamed to belong to your Son, 
Father, forgive us. Let's just take away a moment, and if it helps you to close your eyes, just reflect through this back past week. And if there's anything in particular you think, that hurt God, that hurt others, then just name it in your heart to God and say sorry for it, turn away from it. If there's actions you need to take, resolve to take those actions at the end of the service. But let's do that before we receive God's forgiveness. The Bible is clear that if we admit our sins, if we come clean about them, God won't let us down. He's true to himself. He forgives our sins and cleanses us from all our wrongdoing. So let us receive the forgiveness of God. Blessed is the Lord. Therefore shall our hearts dance for joy. Amen. Amen. Be still for the glory of the Lord. Be shine. Let's pray. Living God, we do thank you that you are here. Lord, we pray for your peace. We pray for your hand on our PA system, Lord, that it wouldn't distract us, but Lord, that we'd focus on you, Jesus. And as Norman comes now to speak, we pray that you'd be with him and that you'd give us ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Is this one working? Oh, it is. Please. One of the battles that I've had in my ministry is battling with PA systems. They're horrible things when they're not behaving themselves. But this is t- tamed now, I think. I want just to take a second, Ross has prayed with me, but I just want to take a second to pray as well. Lord God, living God, living Jesus, Son of God, you are the Word of God. By the power of the Holy Spirit, may you make your Word alive to us this morning. May you speak to us through a living Word that changes us and touches us. And Lord, we want to see Jesus in all his glory we want to see Jesus glorified through what we are and what we do. Grant that we we'll see it this morning, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 
This is a special Sunday in a sense for me and for, well, for Heather now, because it's time for me to hang up the, I was going to say to hang up the Bible, and not at all, not the slightest, to hang up my preaching boots. I've decided to retire, I think, as something I've been thinking about for the last year or so, and one of the things about it is my voice that used to be strong enough to be communicated about these things is getting weaker, and not substantially so, but it has got weaker over the last years, last couple of years. And I want to stop before I'm stopped. But it's been a privilege in many ways to be a preacher. Wonderful privilege. In many senses, sometimes people think you're silly saying things like this, but in many senses, I wouldn't choose anything else in the world if I'd been offered a choice other than preaching the word of God and proclaiming Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. Because I started life uh, as a church-going youngster, but not very often church-going, ended up as an atheist at the uh, middle part of my life, middle, middle teens of my life, went to Queens and was fervently, uh, fervently an atheist, didn't believe there was a God, didn't believe anything about Jesus, went to Queens and within six weeks I was converted. <laughs> the Lord had plans for me that I didn't know about, but that was the beginning of my life in Jesus. And that's what it is to be a converted man or converted woman, is to have a life in Jesus, alive in Jesus, inspired by Jesus, touched by Jesus. My faith is all about Jesus. What I want to do even to the end of my days on earth, what I want to do is glorify Jesus any way I can, any way that God wishes me and gives me the opportunity to. Because I think Jesus is worthy. Jesus deserves all the glory. In my life, there's been wondrous times, amazing times, and I mean that, amazing times with Jesus. There's been times when great and wonderful things have happened through Jesus. It's all about him in a real sense, in a real way. It's not about religion. I didn't become religious at 21 years of age when I asked Jesus into my life. I'm probably more religious than I was then, but I'm not a great deal more religious in one sense, because it's not about religion. It's about a living relationship with Jesus. It's about a living relationship that he walks with me, he talks with me, he lives, beside, he lives within me, he lifts me up, he carries me on, he carries me through. It's all about Jesus. And I want to proclaim him and glorify him and give him thanks and praise for all he's given me over the years. Ross gave me the freedom to choose a, a scripture passage and in many senses, I took that freedom, but also the freedom to preach the passage that relates to what he's about in, in, the, in the Bible lectionary today. It's about Jesus feeding the 5,000. It's one of these great, great, marvelous things in John's Gospel, where he just focuses in on what Jesus is, who he is for a time. And here he's telling us, John's preaching this, Jesus is the light, Jesus is the light of the world, Jesus is the, the bread of life, Jesus is the coming one. Jesus is all sorts of things. But I want to focus in on that bit in the middle there. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus come, came to be the one who would be the bread of life for people like me and you and all of us who respond to his call and his invitation. I want to focus in on that because there's lessons galore in it, but not religious lessons. Lessons to encourage us to walk with Jesus to know him, to love him, to serve him, to follow him. That's the greatest and magnificent thing that we are called to, the wonder of it all. And Jesus is wondrous. Jesus is magnificent. And some years ago, I found a poem that I re-found in my computer this week. And it's called The Solitary Life, One Solitary Life. And I'm going to take a minute or two just to talk about it, or just to read it. This is about... Jesus. He was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in a still another village where he worked as in a carpenter shop until he was 30. And then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never had a family or owned a house. He didn't go to college. He never visited a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place where he was born. He did none of those things. One usually associates with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. 
He was only 33 when the tide of public opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. He was turned over to his enemies and went through a mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing. The only property he had on earth. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave to the pity of a friend. Twenty centuries have come and gone, and today he is the central figure of the human race. He is the central figure of the human race. Despite all that's there, all the talk, all the nonsense, Jesus is the central figure of the human race. And the leader of mankind's progress, all the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned, put together, have not affected the life of the man on earth as much as that one solitary life. And I would just simply say that's hallelujah to that, that's true in my experience, true in the Bible, true in our lives. The wonder of Jesus, he's the one and the only one. He came into my life when I was 21 years of age, those years ago. He's walked with me, he's talked with me, as I've said. He's helped me through all sorts of situations and scenes. He's given me much in abundance. And that's what he wants to do for us all and to us all and through us all. And John's story of the feeding of the 5,000 takes us to a place where we can see Jesus in action. A great crowd of people were following Jesus because he'd just been teaching them and, and leading them and doing miracles amongst them. And Jesus went to draw aside and get some break with his disciples. He went by the side of the Lake of Galilee, Sea of Tiberias. He crossed the, force, the far shore of the Sea of Tiberias and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs that he performed by healing the sick. Here's the setting this, in John chapter 6 for this story of the feeding of 5,000. Jesus and his disciples have been out on mission journeys. They've been out for a whole year nearly non-stop. They're tired, they're a bit frustrated probably, the, not Jesus but the disciples. You get that impression because when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He only asked them to test them, for he already had in mind what to do. Philip answered, it would take more than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. The disciples' faith is a bit weak and low, isn't it? They're tired, they're weary. They wanted some time with Jesus. They wanted to hear that Jesus had called them to come to a part for a while and be with him. They wanted that time with Jesus. They wanted to be restored, renewed, revitalized. They wanted the tanks filled up again for the ministry that lay ahead. But the crowd was coming. The crowd knew where Jesus had gone. And we're told that 5,000 men were part of this crowd. And people have worked out that 5,000 men means probably they were all together about 20,000 people there following Jesus. Out in the wilderness, out in a place with no shops. And Philip would have known, for Philip was a disciple from that place. Tiberias was his hometown. Whenever Jesus asked Philip, to go, where can you buy some bread here? He says, there's not a chance, Jesus, not a chance. Half a year's wages wouldn't buy, buy enough bread for to feed these people. But Jesus knew what he was going to do, do and John understands that. Jesus asked them to look around, have a, a, a racky. Do you see anything that can happen here? We're not going to be able to buy bread. Where, where can we find some bread? Andrew, Jesus said. What about you? Simon Peter's brother spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fishes. But how far would they go among so many? Here's a situation where a great tidal wave is coming in against the disciples and Jesus there too in the mountainside. A great tidal wave of need. Big need. Real need. Need for star hungry people. Hungry people who are in the heat of the day and the cold of the night could be suffering in different ways because they have no bread to eat. No of anything apart from the young lad's five, five small barley loaves and two small fishes. It's like a great tidal wave coming in. A tidal wave of need. What's Jesus going to do about it? Is he going to run? 
Is he and his disciples going to scoot away out of the road quick before the crowd come and get somewhere else where they'll not be bothered? I think the disciples might have felt that that's what they'd like to do. But Jesus is not letting them off. And Jesus isn't taking the easy road himself. As he sees the great crowd coming towards him, we're told that he had compassion upon them. Jesus had compassion on them. His heart went out to them. His heart longed for them to, be ma- to, to meet them in their need. He longed to feed them with bread. He longed to feed them with the bread of life. He didn't want this opportunity to be wasted. And he didn't want the disciples to slip off and get off on the easy side of things. He wanted them involved. So Jesus asked the disciples, Philip, not enough bread. Andrew, the wee boy here with five barley loaves and two small fishes. The wee lad beside them, here's my lunch. You can have it. And what is that among so many? But Jesus knows what he's doing and John says that. He already knew what he was doing. He wasn't caught out by the need. He wasn't overwhelmed by the need. He he, he was able to respond to it right away. The compassion of Jesus. That's what stands out abundantly clearly in this passage and in this gospel and in the whole of the gospels in in the New Testament. The compassion of Jesus is enormous. We really see it in Bible terms. Compassion on hungry people, really hungry people. Not just people whose tummies are rumbling because their, their, their lunch is late. Really hungry people in a desert, in a wilderness place. Danger of starvation. Jesus has compassion on them. His heart goes out to them. And as his heart goes out to them to meet the need, this great this tidal wave of need, as his heart goes out to them to meet the need, then we see him getting into action need Jesus action to sort it out that's the pattern here Jesus knew what he was going to do he got the people all to sit down they sat down Jesus took the loaves from the wee lad gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted he did the same with the fish what did he do how did he do it did he call down an army of angels to bring lunch for all the disciples and for all the crowd No. What did he do? Well, we're not told exactly what he did, but we know what happened. That's the way it was. The disciples were brought in to help, have the people sit down. There's plenty of grass in that place. And they sat down about 5,000 men. I've already said about that. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. How is that going to meet the need of two? Well, say, we'll stick with 5,000. How is that going to meet the need? The compassion of Jesus is great, but it's not very practical here, is it? What way is he going to solve the problem? What solution is he going to come up with? What he needs is he needs to somehow get bread somewhere or other. But where? Nowhere on a human level. What does he do? He gives thanks. He takes the five loaves and the two fish and he gives thanks. Simple act. Just taking the loaves, holding up before God the Father and giving thanks to God the Father for the bread and the fish. And then he began to break the loaves up. We had the disciples involved now. He broke the, seemingly this is the way it worked. He broke the, the bread, the five small barley loaves. He broke the fish. He handed it to the disciples. He handed it to the people. And it just spread and spread and spread. The people must have been absolutely astounded and amazed. We're not told too much about any of them reacting in any way. We don't, we're not told anything about people refusing the food. They just simply responded to Jesus' action. And it happened. A miracle happened. A miracle so insignificant and important that every one of the gospel writers, all four of the gospel writers, tell this story. Tell this story. Apart from the crucifixion and the resurrection, it's the one story that all four evangelists, all four gospel writers record. What happened? We love to know what happened. We love to get the cameras in there, get the commentators in there, find out what happened, tell us what happened. They were as lost as anybody else. Even when talking to the disciples, what happened? Well, Andrew, for instance, 
But I brought the wee boy's lunch. I brought the wee boy with his lunch, and he, he gave the lunch to Jesus, and Jesus prayed, and Jesus broke the bread, and he gave me some bread, and I gave it to these people sitting beside me. And yet there was more. And then I gave them more bread to the people sitting beside them, and yet there was more. 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 It just kept on spreading. It just kept on spreading. Now, you can disbelieve that if you want. You're, God gives you free will, gives, gives us all free will. You can disbelieve that as a miracle. I've seen enough in my lifetime to see other things happen. Not on that scale, I admit, but to see much happen. Glorious, wonderful things happen as Jesus is brought into the situation, as Jesus is given the leadership in the situation. And Jesus just makes it all happen. He brings it all to pass. And you're left standing at the end of the day. What happened? What happened? I got real bread, real barley loaves, a few, a bit of, a few, of the, a bit of few fishes. So how, how did that happen? We just don't know. And the Bible doesn't try and explain it. Jesus gives what they need. Jesus satisfies that need. They all have enough. John emphasizes that. They all have enough. He says, gather the pieces that are left over. Leave nothing, let nothing be wasted. Everybody has enough. And the enough is enough, is enough, is enough. Enough to feed this massive crowd. Enough to meet the needs of this big tsunami of need where the people were starving. Jesus did what was necessary. Jesus did what the people needed. And he gave them enough. They weren't hungry anymore. How did it happen? I don't know, but I'm not hungry anymore. I had bread, I ate bread and two fish. I just can't understand it. If you don't understand it, just go along with it. Follow it on, follow it through. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets full of the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. You could say it's sort of recycling things here, filling the baskets for the leftovers. But it's just John making it clear, as the other disciples do, the other evangelists do too, just John making it clear, there was enough. Not more than enough. Enough to satisfy their hunger. Enough to get them through the night. Enough to give them time in the morning to get bread in the, the normal way. Enough. Jesus brings enough, but enough is enough. It's not scanty. It's not miserly. It's not little scrapings of things. It's not little leftovers in the wrong sense of the word. It's enough. I certainly find in my life that Jesus is enough. Jesus satisfies. He gives what I need. He has given what I need. He's given what you need. Jesus is enough. That's wonderfully true. Gloriously true. Jesus, the bread of life, satisfies. I can testify to that through all the years. If you want to add up the years, 56 years. <laughs> I forgot to count. 56 years ago in October. If you work it out yourself, I told you it was 21 at the time. And Jesus gives enough. There are times we struggle, there are times we have difficulties, there are times we would love to see other things happen, but Jesus gives what we need. His compassion is great, His miracle is magnificent. The wonder of Jesus is worth just celebrating now and always. Jesus is enough. Have you discovered that for yourself? Bible passages are given like this, sermons are preached like this, to challenge people. Have you given to Jesus your heart and soul? Have you opened up your heart and soul to Jesus? Have you trusted him as your Savior and Lord? Because there's no other way to find enough than to surrender to Jesus. Have you ever asked Jesus into your life? Have you ever asked Jesus 
to bring away, to bring forgiveness for your sin? Have you ever asked Jesus to wash you clean? Have you ever asked Jesus to fill you with the Holy Spirit? Well, if you haven't, do it. And find Jesus is enough in all those areas and more besides. Jesus is enough. And the call and purpose of following Jesus is to engage with him in that ministry of giving to others enough for their lives. My life as a Christian is 56 years long. <laughs> I should have counted before, the, before I said that. It's always been enough for me. And the challenge remains with me. Don't stop giving to Jesus. Don't stop giving over your life to Jesus. Don't stop being obedient to Jesus. Don't stop being the one who's part of that miracle of feeding the 5,000, of feeding the multitudes with the word of God, of feeding your soul. Jesus is enough. Do you know that? Have you found that out to be true for yourself? We're all Oh man, we'll just keep it off, I think, rather than coming in and out of those noises. Um, Norman, thank you. We'll uh, talk about this or stitch stay a wee bit uh, later on. But for now, we're going to continue in worship. Let's stand together. You may not be able to hear the band so well, but uh, hopefully you'll know the song. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? Let's stand and we'll sing out together.
Amen. Let's take our seats. We're going to take some time to pray together. And if we can uh, repeat the words that are in blue. Um, so we'll introduce each section of prayer. If you repeat the words in blue, and then we'll just pause for a moment or two to pray about that area. Okay? Let's first of all pray for global events, for natural disasters, and for areas of need. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Let's pause and let's pray in that area. We pray for our streets, for our neighbors, and for our communities. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done. pray for our schools, starting up again soon, for nurseries, for youth workers. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done. pray for our governments, for our financial systems. We pray for businesses, especially local businesses in this area. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done. And lastly, we pray for the lonely, the hurting, and the desperate. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Let's draw our prayers together as we join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Just a few wee notices before our closing song. It's been an eventful wee service, hasn't it? Um, the problem with our PA system is intermittent, so it's very hard to reproduce it for our sound engineer to fix it. But we'll try again this week. And thank you men who rallied round and tried to get things going today. But uh, we will get there in the end. So sorry about the distraction this morning. Family Festival, thank you so much for everybody who participated in making things happen, those who cooked and tidied up, those who still got some tidy up to do, I think. Thank you very much, all. We appreciate it. And thank you for coming along. Hope you've enjoyed it. And do come along to the next one. Now, as you heard, today is a, a, an auspicious day. Um, Norman Jardine, I went for hanging up your classic and collar rather than hanging up the Bible. So I thought that was a wee bit more more sound. So uh, we have really appreciated Norman's uh, ministry in terms of preaching and leading services. We love his grace, we love his uh, love for the Lord and his just down-to-earthness and we're very deeply appreciative of your ministry here in St. John's, Norman, but across this diocese and beyond as well. So thank you, thank you so much. We have a wee gift I was reliably informed by someone who knows them very well of his great interest in prayer.
of course, he's retiring from this, but he continued to minister, and as he put it, glorify Jesus with Heather in the way that they live, in the way that they are among us, because that's the nature of the man, but he is retiring from service leading and preaching, and again, thank you. Um, just, uh, we noticed that in the end of the month from August 27th to 30th, we have the Diocesan Bible Week. So Bishop Stuart Bell is coming over from England and he'll be speaking on four parables across those four evenings uh, over in Dollingstown. We'll be going to a couple of the evenings, Sonia and myself. If you want to join us, we'll give you a lift. Uh, if you want to go on your own, I'd really recommend it. They're always good evenings, good worship, good teaching. So do uh, check it out. Right, we're going to stand and we're going to close with a song. Uh, it's... With my whole heart, I will praise you. It seems a very fitting way to finish this service. Not sure what's going to happen with the sound, but if you know it, sing it out. Let's stand and we'll sing this as our closing worship together. Acoustic. With my whole heart I will praise you, holding nothing back. Hallelujah, you have made me glad and now I come with open arms to thank you with my heart embrace. Hallelujah, I can see your face is smiling, with my whole life I will serve you, captured by your love, hallelujah, oh amazing love, oh amazing Lord, your heart is overflowing with our love divine. Hallelujah. And this love is mine forever. Now your heart has set you laughing as you join the song. sings along I hear the voices swell to great crescendos praising your great love hallelujah oh amazing love there'll be prayer if anyone would like prayer for themselves or for others just in front of the pulpit here otherwise you know we're a bit earlier today if you're at 11 30 so why don't we spend some time having a coffee and talking to each other and uh, we'll see you next week hopefully with the pa system that works god bless <laughs>